Gary Tuck is um, a good friend of mine, and uh, by, uh, I guess, virtue of the World Championship of Shoemaking, we've had a, a lot of time to kind of hang out uh, over the several years, and you actually came through Dallas uh, not long after last year's uh, championship, which was nice. Uh, Gary is the author of a, uh, an exceptional book called Master Shoemakers. Uh, this is um, a book that he wrote that is really a pretty broad survey uh, uh, as many, if not all, of the, the prominent bespoke shoemakers out there. Uh, and for anyone that's into shoes, which of course uh, is what this channel is all about, um, this is uh, a coffee table piece or a library piece that has some absolutely exceptional photography and then I think speaks through Gary's experience of having gone out there and worked with all these makers. And uh, I guess we can all benefit vicariously through you uh, as you kind of pull this information together and allow us to consume it because you've had more shoes made by more people uh, than even I could ever dream about. And that's, um, that's something to be said because I've got a lot of shoes. <laughs> so, uh, Gary, what was the, um, you know, talk to me a little bit about uh, what the, um, you know, what was the inspiration for this book? I mean, this is kind of how you came online in the menswear community was with this book. And since then, I mean, you know, you've certainly maintained a, a great profile and, uh, and in, uh, certainly an influence on Instagram and everything. But this book really is kind of that cornerstone piece that really kind of launched, I guess, your profile in many ways. Would you say that? Well, yeah, I, I guess, I guess uh, you could say that. I mean, um, prior to that, I was quite active on um, a couple of menswear forums where I posted under my pseudonym, uh, Gazman70K. And I, I really enjoyed writing about menswear and writing about um, some of my sartorial adventures with some other uh, individuals on the forum and things like that. And, and I really enjoyed sharing information. Um, and I also spent quite a bit of time uh, dabbling in, in, in amateur photography. And, and you know, this kind of accumulated, accumulated in, in, the, uh, in an adventure that I thought, hey, I, I was going to look for it. You know, a bespoke shoemaker for myself. I was going to investigate them, study them, uh, find the right style that suited me, the right maker that would suit it, that that would suit me. And I thought, why not document it? The original idea was to do it um, as a web, uh, as a as a as a blog. But I thought, you know what? With the artisanal element of shoemaking, it's something very tangible. Um, why not put together a book? And I never did it before. I thought it'd be a nice little adventure. Uh, do something different, uh, and and I did it. Um, I'm I'm not a professional writer. Uh, I enjoy writing in my free time. I for my you know occupation, I do a lot of business writing, and uh, I kind of joke that you know in my career I've written tomes and tomes of documents, which ultimately goes to the end reader, and they would flip through the executive summary, they would flip to the findings, and then they would read the price, and that's it. That's like 200 pages, and they would probably read three pages. Yeah. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to channel all my efforts into this and, and only have people read three pages. Well, why not try something for myself and make it uh, uh, useful? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's a great book. Um, I mean, I've really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. I mean, and, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you've had the opportunity and really, you know, the privilege in a lot of ways to travel the world uh, to meet a lot of these shoemakers and you know even for those that are into shoes like you know I mean my experience with the bespoke shoemakers is primarily uh, in Europe and then a little bit in Paris uh, and I haven't had much exposure in Italy just because I don't travel there as frequently uh, as I do uh, London and Paris but I mean you travel quite extensively to Italy because a lot of your bespoke tailors are uh, in Naples uh, and so you've got this really wide kind of uh, swath of or cross-section if you will, or survey of bespoke shoemakers that I think is interesting to read about in terms of their different styles and um, you know their different personalities in a lot of way. Yeah, a lot. I think um, I think you know the the world of bespoke shoemakers and artisans in general. It's a very personality driven business, um, and ultimately, when you look for the right person to work with. It is a search for that that right chemistry. Um, so a lot of it was spending time with uh, the different shoemakers, and and I was fortunate enough to, uh, I had I had known some of them for a while. Um, while I was traveling, I'd gone into their stores and built up a bit of a relationship, and then eventually when I decided to do the book, um, I reached out to them, and in fact every one of them said yes they would participate. So that was really good, and uh, and then that's where we built it from, uh, built the relationship from there, um, and it, it's it's. 
you know, it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, I've met a lot of great people through it. Met people like yourselves, uh, some mutual friends that you and I have in 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 Texas, uh, who all great people. So it's uh, it's a very very nice way of building the community. But at the same time, I've done it out of a, a labor of love. It's not my profession. I'm I'm doing it as a hobby. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, you know, I feel that I can add something to the, uh, the, the, the menswear literature that's generally out there and give a slightly different perspective mm -hmm. uh, from a, a pure user perspective, as opposed yeah. to, you know, some of the more uh, professional journalistic elements to the, to the, yeah. to the uh, uh, literature. Well, how big of a difference do you see kind of, uh, uh, you know, internationally between the different shoemakers, you know, the Japanese, the English? Uh, even within England, the kind of the West End versus, you know, like the Northampton makers, uh, and then going from French to Italian, um, you know, for someone that maybe isn't quite as familiar with that, I mean, how would you, how would you compare that? I mean, are they all essentially doing the same work? I mean, bespoke shoes at the end of the day is bespoke shoes, or uh, it is a different, you know, between countries? It is different. Actually, actually, here's, here's the funny thing. Um, I kind of think, you know, we, we spent a bit of time in, in Texas together. And one of the things I, I really enjoyed in Texas was uh, uh, Central Texas barbecue. And Central Texas barbecue is literally beef, salt and pepper, smoke, heat. And, and, and it's, it's the equivalent, it's the culinary equivalent to NASCAR. And the spoke shoes, to some degree, when you look at the different uh, uh, makers, it is also to some degree... Um, an interpretation of what is ultimately a classic range of shoes. Yeah. And the French have interpreted it in a particular way. The uh, English, uh, whether they're very traditional to the more modern English, uh, have interpreted it in their particular way. And the Italians have taken elements of it and, and, and uh, taken it their direction. And the Austrians and the Germans, uh, in particular, you know, one of my the most admired German shoemakers I know, is uh, Patrick Frey, and he's he's done some amazing things uh, from from that perspective. And there are a lot of subtle differences. I mean, and there's no one unique uh, element that would say it, it pops. But you know, there's there's the use of leather, the uh, the patina, the coloring of it, the uh, you know the proportions of how they would make the shoe, uh, the narrowness, the sharpness, the pointiness, the uh, the shape of the toe, the broadness of the of the of the bamp. All those elements add up. Um, and you do see some going a little bit further than others. Um, the, you know, for example, Cothe in France really advanced that. Uh, and, and both both Pierre and, and Christophe both have done very, very unique things uh, with shoes. And I think in terms of design and, and pushing the boundaries of design, really the French are really up there because with, yeah. with Oversea no and on all these other makers, they, they make some beautiful, beautiful, you know, artistic level uh, shoes. Yeah. Um, and different people can wear them. So, for example, for me, I can admire those from afar. They almost works of art for me, but it wouldn't be a pair that I would wear uh, in terms of the French styling. But, you know, I have some friends uh, who are really into the shoes and they dress in a very particular style and, and those shoes suit them extremely well. They look so good in them, but it's certainly not something I could feel comfortable in, but I certainly admire the workmanship. Yeah. Well, even if you look at... Um... I mean, I think the French is a great example where, you know, there's a certain refinement to the French bespoke shoes that in some ways, uh, in my opinion, is a product of the haute couture kind of history and aesthetic that you yeah. have in uh, Paris. I mean, they're used to being more fashion forward and more creative uh, versus a British shoe, uh, which is, you know, very just, um, you know, it's very historic. It's very regimented. It's very... Um, you know, it's very boxed in a lot of ways in terms of uh, kind of what you can and cannot do a lot, and in many ways like the British culture, um, and, and not in a negative way by any, by any means. And um, I think within that you see a little bit of kind of design influences, but uh, that said, I mean, a British shoe is going to be more classic, more conservative, more traditional, but then you go to Paris and you see what Corte is doing, uh, you'd see what Berluti is doing, you see what, uh, you know, even, um, uh, gosh, who is it um, that we just had on last week? the name escaping my mind um who is it Felipe Tenza yeah I mean you yeah, see the work that yeah, he does he, and I think he was showing us an elephant shoe a blue elephant or no it was an elephant it was um hippo it was a blue hippo shoe with the Norwegian storm welt you know and it was uh, amazing but he's also capable of really conservative stuff 
Uh, and all his stuff has a certain degree of finishing, just in terms of the layering of the heel stack, you know, the tightness of the welts, the fudging uh, on top of the welt. I mean, all that is incredibly well uh, kind of pulled together and refined, um, you know, even whenever you compare it to some of the best, best of stuff to come out of London. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, you, you can kind of think about that, right? There's, there's always the, there's going to be things like the design elements, and then there's the, going to be the construction elements as well. And, and what I really love about the diversity of shoemakers is that, you know, there can be a real focus on the craft and the actual artisanal and making nature. And, you know, a lot of the Japanese are doing that. So when you look at the work that Yohei puts out and the things that, um, you know, uh, some of the newer Japanese shoemakers, uh, one of my favorite ones at the moment is uh, Seiji McCarthy. Yeah. Uh, and 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 so he has a particular take of it because he's uh, you know he is a, uh, a an American Japanese heritage who learned how to make English shoes, but it didn't speak to his American uh, background. And he thought, you know, I'm going to start making bespoke shoes to the style of American uh, uh, American shoemaking. Yeah. And uh, and you know, it, it's great to see what he's doing in that space. So. There's a lot of diversity and there's a lot of interpretation, and, and I think that's a lot of fun. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you've got a huge collection of shoes. I mean, do you have anything there that you can kind of show us? I mean, it would be interesting to, to, to actually see you talk uh, through some of your favorite examples. Yeah, sure. So one of my favorite shoemakers is actually a, a gentleman named uh, Hidetaka Fukaya, uh, or the shoemaker from Florence, a Japanese uh, a, a shoemaker who, who resides in Florence. Uh, and 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 he's made me about three three or four pairs. And um, this this pair here, I, I don't know if you can see it, but that's uh, that's one of Hold my favorite. The, yeah, a little bit in the center, more <laughs> simpler. Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. There we go. So you can see that he's got. Doesn't even look like he's worn it. it. It's yeah. It's one of my ones, and I've taken care of it quite well. Uh, but it's certainly one of my favorite pairs uh, because this is my third pair or fourth pair with him. And he's really nailed the proportions now. I have uh, particularly broad feet. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens after this, this scenario is that um, the, the, you know, the elegance of the shoe uh, gets distorted by the broadness of the feet. And he's managed to hit the proportions right. Yeah, um, which is a big I, element of last baking is really balancing the foot out. I mean, in a, lot of way, in a lot of ways, or in the same way that a great cutter is able to balance the aesthetic and minimize certain elements of, of the body posture, a great shoemaker does the same thing for the foot and, um, you know, while, while at the same time creating an incredibly close fitting and comfortable shoe, it's more, more difficult than it seems. Yeah, exactly. And, and this one's uh, another pair I have. Again, it's a black one. It's an Adelaide uh, Capto and it's from uh, Shoji-san or, or Marquez. And this one is really interesting because uh, the way Shoji made this pair of shoe over the, the, the period of fitting, he, he did three fittings for me. And each subsequent fitting, um, he noticed that uh, while my feet were broad, um, they were quite malleable. And he continually started to tighten and narrow the last with each subsequent fitting. And he found that I was, I didn't feel any discomfort. And uh, he, he kept on, of, you know, turning the vice until you called uncle. Ah, this is too tight. Okay, go back to the exactly. prior fitting. And, 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 and the result of it was when I when I show his shoe to my other shoemakers, they go, he he's got the proportions right, and and and, and they ask how how did he actually do it, and he says it's just through the fittings and him tightening the vice like like one would tighten the corset if you may, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I got a very interesting pair of shoes out of him, and I've got two pairs of them. You know, with it. a totally and, different uh, toe shape too. I mean, that's much more of a soft kind of round, versus exactly. the ones from Florence are you know, a little bit more of a, a point. Exactly. So, so yeah. So I, I kind of tried uh, different things, and, and Shoji has a strong English heritage, and um, and given that I had a, a number of chisel toed shoes, I thought you know with him I'll go with a round toe, um, and and they came out spectacular. I really love it. Um, and the other one, which I don't have a pair here right now, is um, is uh, Nicholas Templeman, and I, I think you know Nicholas very well, mm -hmm. and uh, Nicholas uh, making me a couple of pairs, and and the latest one. I think he's finished it. He was supposed to be out in Hong Kong, uh, I think um, mid-March, but unfortunately he couldn't make it out. So I'm just waiting for that pad to be delivered, but it's, uh, it's really cool. Yeah, well, Nicholas is, a, uh, I think, a great kind of happy medium. I mean, I like 
You know, he's got the provenance of having worked at John Lobb, St. James's, and, but as an independent, he has much more latitude in kind of the way and how he can do things. And then from a price point, I mean, he's incredibly, um, you know, he's a incredibly, incredibly uh, compelling. I mean, it's a great value in a lot of ways. That Dominate Casey's a great value. Um, and so Nicholas, we're going to have hopefully on next week if we can nail him down in terms of the scheduling. So across these different shoemakers, uh, I mean, do you see differences in approach towards uh, like arch support and how much hard countering there is? I mean, are there other elements of, of the actual fit in the construction that you see very widely? Or, you know, are those elements, you know, pretty consistent across your shoemakers because they're a function of your foot anatomy? I think uh, where I am at the moment, having done so, um, uh, you know, a number of pairs, I've kind of figured out my feet. Um, so with um, with makers like like Nicholas and Shoji and some of the more recent uh, makers I've been working with, I've started to tell them where I need the art support, uh, which parts of the uh, 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 you know the the insole and things like that I would prefer uh, greater stiffness in leather and things like that. So. I think I'm at the, the the point where I can actually guide them as to how my feet uh, feel, and uh, and I've been learning all the time. And and check, so so I I kind of kind of dictate to them what I want now because I feel that I'm at the point of experience where I know what I what I want and what I want out of shoe and and things like that. Yeah, and um, I guess that's the, of, that's kind of the product and one of the benefits of having worked with a bunch of different makers is you kind of go broad, and you get a wider survey of what's possible. And then once you wear those things and really determine what you like, you're able to narrow. I mean, do you, do you find that that's kind of what phase you're at right now, where there are certain shoemakers you've had make things uh, from you in the past that you probably wouldn't go back to, uh, and, but then maybe there's elements of the shoe that they made that you'll kind of bring into some of your other makers to kind of really tighten things? No, and you're right. Uh, that's exactly where I am right now because, I mean, ultimately with Bespoke, um, it's a real investment in time. So, um, and probably in the case for like you and various others who are a little bit more advanced in terms of bespoke, you come to a point whereby you really are careful who else you try because there is that investment in time. And sometimes you just don't have the, uh, the flexibility or the capacity. And this is a great example right now, whereby there's a lockdown and, um, and you can't travel and you know, you, you either buy from someone you know or um, or uh, wait till uh, you can travel again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how many, I mean, how many shoemakers do you think in two or three years, you know, you'll, you'll have as part of kind of like an ac active rotation of people making for you? I mean, do you think you'll go down to just one or two or uh, would you see yourself having, you know, three, four, five and continuing to kind of dabble in new guys as they pop up? Or, you know, as someone that, you know, has a really well-developed, you know, shoe wardrobe. I mean, shoot. I mean, you've written an entire you've written an entire book about kind of all the different people you've had make shoes. Um, you know, in that evolution of just kind of the bespoke lifestyle, or not lifestyle style, but life cycle. Uh, do you find yourself kind of centering on what you think is kind of just a happy medium? I I think I've hit my happy medium so right now because um, I'm really looking for that something special if I were to work with them. And, and I, I come back to, um, you know, two or three shoemakers that I'm really uh, working with right now. And they're really uh, Nicholas, uh, Seiji, and Shoji. Um, those are my three key ones that I'm spending time with. And there's a, one other fourth one, uh, which is Saskia. Um, so uh, Saskia Whitmer in Florence. So those are the three to four that I've, I've, I've spent, you know, the last year or so uh, focused on. And, um, and I haven't seen anything out there that really says that this is the one I want to try. Um, I've seen some, but really I have to balance convenience as well. So if you notice yeah. that the, the three that I'm working closely with are, are Japanese, and, and for me to get from Hong Kong to Tokyo is uh, relatively easy. And, uh, and, and, and that's what I've centered my, 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 my requirements around. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that makes a, a lot of sense. I mean, that's one of the things I talk a lot uh, whenever it comes to bespoke making is that, um, you know, at the end of the day, there has to be a, pra uh, a practicality or a pragmatism uh, to the relationship because if you can't ever see your bespoke maker, uh, then, um, you know, then your shoes are never going to get done. Exactly. And, 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 you know, it doesn't mean I'm just doing bespoke. So, for example, 
you know, um, there, there, there are opportunities and, and, and times where, you know, I do go get their ready to wear or uh, something that I need to you know, fill out a particular gap. And sometimes it's easy to just get a pair ready to wear. And it depends also on my needs because I, I travel a lot. And sometimes you just kind of don't want to take your bespoke shoes to be, you know, jumping on flights, walking down airports and, you know, dragging across, uh, you know, Manila, Makati, where I, I do spend a bit of time in terms of work or in uh, some of the uh, Southeast Asian countries, the cities where I go to, where, like, you know, the, the, the pavements and things like that are relatively rough and, and the shoes take a beating. So, you know, I, I have I have different pairs with different needs and, and yeah, this, this balance is out. Uh, if you're on Instagram, make sure you follow Gary Talk on Instagram. It's Gazman70. Uh, uh, we'll put that Gazman70k. Uh, you can kind of see Gary's looks, uh, and a little bit uh, in, a, in a little bit we'll actually go through some of these looks. Uh, if Gary's a collection of bespoke shoes uh, is uh, is large, his collection of bespoke suits is huge. And so I thought it'd be fun to have Gary talk through a few of his different looks and kind of compare and contrast cuts and fits and different styles kind of across makers and across regions. Uh, If you're also on Instagram, please follow uh, Kirby Allison. Please follow me on Instagram. I just passed the 30,000 follower mark, so thank you for that. Uh, And this is a great way to kind of see uh, what we're up to, uh, who our live streams are. Uh, And honestly, if you have any questions or have a pair of shoes that you shine and want me to take a look at them, uh, it's a great way to connect with me directly. And then, of course, uh, Gary's book, Master Shoemakers, uh, is available from HangarProject.com. Uh, we've got these in our warehouse. So if you'd like to see Gary's book, uh, it is, uh, I can't recommend it more uh, for anyone that's interested in bespoke shoemaking. And it's probably one of the best ways uh, to gain a really broad survey of the different makers, uh, their styles, and really what sets them apart uh, from one another. So uh, this book is, without question, a reference piece for anyone that is into bespoke shoes. So there we go. Thank you for that. So Gary, you're going to suits. I mean, you've got, well, actually a few questions. So toe plates, I spoke a little bit about toe plates. You walk a lot, you know, you're based in Hong Kong. Uh, it's a pedestrian city. Uh, do you put toe plates on your shoes? I mean, what's your opinion on toe plates? Toe plates on every one of them. Yeah, and that's, I mean, so talk to me about that. I mean, you know, why are you putting toe plates on your shoes? Because it's really not something that's offered much ready to wear. So unless you're buying bespoke, you really, you know, probably never have the option to, to get shoes with toe plates unless you send them in. And we have a toe plate only service, so people can do that here in the United States. But it was my experience with bespoke shoemakers that actually kind of catalyzed and gave me the inspiration to do that. Well, the, the funny thing is, um, it's actually, when you look at the wear of a shoe, it just depends on how you walk. And, um, and strangely enough, if you do a lot of walking, uh, and in particular in Asia, where you know the pavements aren't always as smooth as they are, and and um, in, you know in certain types of cities where the pavements are a little bit rougher, um, and if you're walking down airports a lot, I found that uh, the toe the toe tip of it gets uh, um, roughed up quite a lot, and because I've noticed that, I, I kind of and then with my experience with the spoke. I realized that having the toe tips actually make a massive difference. Um, so that's actually uh, made me go change every one of them and have them installed. Um, so I'm a big fan of them. I, you know, every new pair that I get, um, it's a must. Yeah, especially for people that are in walking cities. Um, you know, inevitably you're going to wear through the toes first. And I was having an interesting conversation with Dominic Casey about this. He was actually saying that as the lash shapes have elongated. Right, the uh, bespoke shoemakers have had to put more spring uh, into the last in order to allow the toe to clear, and that's what's in a lot of ways resulted uh, in the, uh, you know, in more wear through the toes in today's shoes than what you would have found 50 years ago, whenever the lasts were shorter and slightly wider. I mean, that's was kind of an aesthetic point. So, uh, this day and age, I, I mean, toe plates are actually quite important. Yeah, and, and, and Dominic is uh, made a very astute and obviously very technical observation there, and, and that's true. I mean, um, I, I've noticed that my, the shoes that I have that are a little bit longer in last and uh, design, they, they, they actually uh, uh, benefit the most out of them. So yeah. he's spot on, as he should be. Yeah, well, Dominic, he's uh, uh, certainly uh, just, I mean, what a character. I love Dominic. Uh, and the shoes that he made were I, beautiful. I, I, I remember uh, one of your comment, one of the, your 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 followers' comments on your, your video with him. Uh, I think he said, uh, "Dominic, uh, the best hair, the best hair in the business." 
<laughs> yeah, for sure. And the best mustache or goatee or whatever he's, <laughs> he's sporting at the boat. So um, it is 2 a.m. there in Hong Kong. So thank you so much for kind of staying up with us. And um, yeah, it's, it's 2.30 right now, isn't it? Yeah, I, um, I don't sleep a lot. So uh, uh, it's one of the things that uh, I, I, I realize um, uh, as I do multiple projects and I'm constantly busy. So well, and I mean, also working as internationally as you do, I mean, you know, working in internationally from Hong Kong, especially if you're dealing with any of the Western countries, kind of really forces you to stay up late just because of the 13 hour time difference. I mean, it's brutal. Um, yeah, but I, I've been doing this for about 20 years and I'm, I'm used to it. Um, so it's, it's actually okay. I mean, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of used to it. So yeah. it works. Well, let's go, let's go to kind of the next segment here. So you were nice enough to kind of send us some photographs of, um, you know, from Instagram of some of your various suits. And again, I mean, you know, uh, you're actually uh, starting to work on a book on bespoke suiting that's very similar to your master shoemakers where you kind of basically have the same, you know, kind of uh, outfit and then have it made by a bunch of different people. And I think it really speaks uh, to... Uh, kind of what you've done in Master Shoes, Shoemakers, which is offering kind of a broad, concise survey of different makers. So if you wouldn't mind, we're going to pull up some of these images, and I'd love you to just kind of talk through some of the aesthetics of these suits. You know, what makes them different? Uh, different? What do you see? Uh, what were maybe some of the conversations behind those whenever you were commissioning them? And I know that, uh, you know, you're kind of cagey about some of your, uh, you know, your mystery bespoke makers. Uh, but to the extent that you're comfortable, you know, revealing who made something, I think that would be interesting for people to know also. So let's throw up the first one on here, a beautiful double-breasted uh, charcoal flannel, right? Is that what I'm seeing? Yes, it's a, it's a flannel from Harrison's. Uh, this one here was made by uh, Gennaro Paone. Uh, Gennaro, uh, for those of you who are in the know, you would have known that Gennaro uh, was uh, one of the cutters at Rubenacci. He was actually my cutter at Rubenacci, and um, about three years ago, he um, he, he left and uh, um, started you know his own own family business with his son. And uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, have him come out to Hong Kong, uh, and he was uh, sponsored by a fellow Style Forum member. And, uh, and, and we continued our relationship. And this is the second double-breasted suit he made for me. Um, the first one I made was uh, I kind of broke my, my rule a little bit. One of my rules I have is the first garment is actually the, uh, the tailor's garment. Uh, but in that one, I kind of dictated what I wanted. Um, and we had a very bellied uh, lapel. Uh, and the second one, I kind of said, no, why don't you do what you want to do? And uh, this is what he made for me. So this was uh, zero input from me. He, he did everything himself. Um, there was basically other than um, adjustments of the length of the sleeve and a little bit of waist suppression. Um, I didn't give any input at all. Yeah, well, it's a beautiful suit. I mean, it's got uh, a much larger lapel, but it's still quite balanced. I mean, it's not, um, you know, it doesn't overpower the garment, in my opinion. And you can see, again, the beautiful balance of that. And this is a great example of kind of dressing monochromatically. You've got a, a lighter gray tie. Uh, what type of tie was that? Was it a wool, a woolen tie? That's a woolen tie from Drake's uh, that uh, I picked up maybe about five, six years ago. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to play around with this. This was inspired by uh, uh, Henry, uh, 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 you know, one of the, the, the big guys on Instagram. And he... he constantly does this and I, I thought I, I'd try it and uh, it worked out quite well. It's a great look. So the next one we're going to pull up, our second depiction here, is um, another double-breasted suit. But I think that this really showcases just uh, the, the range that you can have in, uh, in cut and aesthetic. I mean, this is a double-breasted suit also, uh, but it really couldn't be any more different than the first ones you had made at, in Naples. So speak a little bit about this and kind of, again, pointing out, I mean, totally different lapel shape. Uh, everything about the lapel is different. I mean, you know, the, the notch is kind of horizontal. I mean, it really is, um, you know, horizontal kind of at your shoulder line, which is a, a nice look. And it's a smaller lapel. It doesn't fall down as much or it doesn't uh, go down as much. The belly isn't as large. So talk about this. It's another beautiful suit. And it looks like a, um, what is it, a houndstooth? What is it? It's a, it's a micro houndstooth uh, Domer um, uh, Sportex. 
And uh, this one's made by uh, Liberano and Liberano. Uh, okay. Antonio did this for me, for Liberano. Um, and it's my 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 first uh, double breasted from Liberano. And um, this one here in particular is is not just my one of my favorites, but for some strange reason, it is also my most liked Instagram post. Uh, this one clocked in something like 2,200 likes. Um, and, and it's the one that um, consistently just gets, gets a lot of attention. I mean, it I'm looks very sure geometric why, but... almost. I mean, in the way that, I mean, the lines are very organized. I mean, you know, the front exactly. panel is straight down. I mean, every, the lines are just perfect on this suit. Well, that's, that's the amazing thing about this one. It, it's, just, it's just proportionately correct. In fact, I had to get this one altered because I lost quite a bit of weight. Uh, between when I first got it made and then subsequently got it altered a bit, and um, and Antonio kind of you know was was uh, nice enough to do it. Uh, alterations obviously after a period of time is is quite uh, uh, inconvenient for for, for tailors, uh, but they were kind enough to do it for me, and it's it's it turned out really well. One of the things I found out about the, this particular cut is that the uh, the shoulders are a little bit narrower than than most of my other suits, and I think it goes really well with that horizontal uh, notch. On the uh, on the lapel because I think if it was a little bit sharper, uh, a little bit more uh, 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 concave, sorry, uh, con uh, convex, uh, it wouldn't work as well. But you know he nailed the proportions of this. It's uh, it's one of my favorite favorite DBs. Yeah. Now will you ever? Great. Yeah. Will you ever button the lower button in order to kind of elongate the roll of the lapel? Um, you mean Ken style? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not a fan of the Kent style. Uh, I've, I've tried it a few times. Uh, I'm not particularly tall. Um, I'm 5'9", uh, but I find that if I, if I did the Kent style, it, it kind of makes me shorter than, than I should. Um, so I, I, I kind of don't do that. I, I prefer, you know, buttoning at the natural waist point. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to jump to another one that is incredibly distinctive. We're going to jump to four. Um, now this, I mean, you know, probably, you know, I don't know, two out of every three people on this channel might be able to identify where that suit's from. I've got my ideas, but why don't you tell us about this one? Because again, totally different than the other ones. Well, this, this one is, uh, I, 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 I don't want to say, use that word, but I find this to be a very sexy, uh, silhouette, uh, in the sense that it's English. Uh, it's made by Michael Brown. Uh, well, uh, I was going to guess Chiefinelli, <laughs> but Michael Brown would be, uh, you know, I mean, that's a second best guess, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is actually a Michael Brown. And he uh, trained and, at Joe and, Morgan. Someone just guessed Chittleboro and Morgan, which would have been a good guess also. Um, and Michael, oh, of course, trained great. under Joe. Exactly. Uh, uh, your, 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 uh, your viewer who, who guessed that is fantastic. I mean, uh, it's something very different. The uh, the roped uh, shoulders and the more structured shoulders is uh, is particularly noticeable. Uh, it's a very different cut. It's it's actually cut a little longer as well. Uh, it looks like. But it. you know it, it. Yeah, it turned out great. Now is this an odd jacket? Uh, it, is this like a blazer or is this a part of a suit? No, it's a it's a blazer. Um, he and I talked a lot about it. Whether I should do a suit or do a. And that's one thing I love about Michael. We, we actually spend something like, you know, 40 minutes before even taking a measurement talking about stuff. And um, I spent a lot of time discussing with the aesthetic and how he would make it for me. And, and, and I kind of en really enjoyed that process. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is a pretty cool. Yeah, the belly, the curve on the lapel is uh, dramatic. I mean, I mean, the amount of kind of curve cut into that lapel you know, I've got these other photographs right in front of me, so it's very easy to compare them, uh, is, um, you know, again, is significant compared even to the first one that was made in Naples. Go up a little bit, Christian. Up, uh, there we go. If you can, there. I think, yeah, it's a little bit easier to see that, kind of the curve. It's a little bit of a dark image, but if you look on the right-hand side, you can kind of, you can start to see the belly of that lapel. It's not as, it's about the same width or maybe not slightly as wide as that first one, but boy, does that lapel have shape. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a really neat, neat lapel. I really like it. Yeah, and then if you look at the, um, 
you know, the notch, again, unlike the one from Liverano that was almost straight across, you know, this one, again, has a little bit more shape going up. It's just, again, one of those other elements on kind of how a double-breasted suit, or even a lapel for that matter, are not all created equal. I mean, there's definitely, Michael Brown, of course, is taking a, a very much a position stylistically on this piece. Yeah. And one of the things that, that um, is not so apparent from this photo um, is that he did cut me a narrower sleeve. Um, so the, the, the sleeve head is fairly full, as you can see from that. But once it comes down to the elbow uh, and elbow to the wrist, it's relatively narrow. And it just gives it a completely different look. Um, and, and for those of you who are experimenting with bespoke, um, strangely enough, those little differences and even the, the narrowness of the sleeve from elbow to, uh, to wrist can make a dramatic difference. But you've got to be careful with the proportions because, you know, if you exaggerate it too much, it looks kind of silly uh, and, 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 and you can take it to a, to a bit of an extreme. But, but he nailed it with this one. Yeah. This was my first jacket. Yeah. And I mean, this construction of that sleeve and the sleeve head uh, is a significant. Uh, Christian, I don't know if you can bump it over a little bit to reveal... Uh, the left sleeve, the one that's kind of falling off the screen. Uh, but there is, um, you know, I mean, the way that that sleeve head works in, I mean, it's, it's actually going into the shoulder quite significantly. It's not just the roping, but the roping falls down to kind of create that drape and that fullness at the top of the sleeve right here uh, that, again, gives the suit an exceptional amount of shape. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of my favorites. Great piece. Okay, Christian, let's jump to number eight. This um, is, uh, looks like an aubergine double-breasted suit. Um, I mean, what color is that? I mean, is it a, is it a purple or a burgundy or a brown? Actually, um, it's just the lighting. Um, the lighting uh, that's sort of in front of me um, was, uh, was sort of a, 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 a warm light. But this is actually brown. Uh, this one is Neapolitan. Uh, again, very different uh, lapel shape, very different shoulder uh, construction. Uh, and this one's done by a um, uh, Neapolitan tailor. It's my my mystery bespoke mystery tailor. Mystery bespoke tailor. Uh, yes. <laughs> There's a bounty <laughs> on that I, I, name, you know, on the internet apparently. That if anyone discovers it, I think well, it's like a thousand dollar bounty. That one, I, I can't take credit for that. That actually belongs to uh, um, a gentleman by the name of uh, Vox Sartoria, uh, Bostonian. Yeah. Uh, amazing guy, and and he coined that term. I kind of borrowed it from him. Yeah. And, and what's um, the idea behind having a mystery bespoke tailor? I mean, you know, generally speaking, I mean, it wasn't proper etiquette to ever ask a man who his tailor was, but in this kind of like hashtag Vinswear kind of, uh, you know, sartorial uh, uh, kind of community, I mean, you know, it's like everyone is talking about who their tailor is. So help me understand what the particular constraints are with this gentleman that would have you, um, you know, really be reluctant to reveal who he is. Well, the thing is, um, it's it's it, this this tailor is actually quite famous in Naples, uh, but what I what he does for me is very different. Um, in fact, uh, I've spoken to to various people, and and they'll say, ah, oh, that that tailor style isn't for me, and, and but then they constantly say that this is a great great looking suit, and the, the things he that that's made by Mystery Bespoke Tailor is uh, looks great without knowing that Mystery. The spoke tailor is the tailor that they didn't particularly like. Um, so and what is it, it just it, like it you working with them that just had him produce something that, I mean, is this his style or were you working with him to do something that was maybe a little bit different than what he would typically do I, I, under I, his we've house? Had, we've worked, I mean, I mean he's, uh, this particular tailor constitutes something like 55% of my wardrobe. So half, half my, my, my suits and jackets in my wardrobe is from this individual. And, um, and, and basically, you know, we've just over time developed uh, a particular style. And, um, and, and, I, and, you know, his particular normal cut is very Neapolitan. And one of the things I found is that um, I, in a suit like this, I don't particularly like the spala camicia. I like the shirt shoulder concept, but I don't like the ruffle. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that we worked on was to remove, uh, was to remove all of the uh, uh, the ruffling on the on, on the shoulders, um, and and that's where we landed with this. But um, this is uh, this is one of my favorite jackets. I, I love it. It's uh, it's an interesting uh, cut to it, 
and you can see from uh, from the the, the four uh, the three uh, sorry the three double breasts that you've seen they're all distinctively different this one in particular has a higher buttoning point uh, I've not uh, it, it, it's cut a little bit higher the lapels are a lot more belly um, and and certainly the the, the shoulders are uh, a little bit extended to this and again yeah. you can notice how he's the sleeve and he, it's a little bit more narrow and it gives uh, it gives a lot more shape. The only difference with this one versus uh, say the uh, the Liberano is the fullness of the trouser. So being Neapolitan, he's done it, uh, you know, uh, pantalone cigaretta, which is the cigarette uh, trouser, which is very narrow and, and, and a little bit uh, tight. But uh, but otherwise, it's a uh, it's it's a good silhouette. Yeah, that's great. So I mean, yeah, you know, four double-breasted suits, all exceptionally different. And um, I mean, gosh, you could do a case study just in and uh, aesthetics just on these four in terms of how different they are. So let's go back to the third depiction and let's go through some of your single-breasted suits. Uh, but real quick before I get there, a good question. You know, what's your opinion on wearing double-breasted suits kind of in a business environment? I mean, you know, some people I feel, uh, you know, are a little bit intimidated by double-breasted suits because they're so formal. Um, and in an environment where dressing up in a suit already sometimes is at kind of the far range of kind of acceptable formality with most people, you know, not wearing ties, uh, not even wearing suits for that matter. A uh, double-breasted suit, you know, really seems to, uh, you know, kind of take the ante uh, and really, uh, you know, to the next level. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Is that just a personal comfort thing? I mean, I find that my double-breasted suit that I had Joe make for me, you know, maybe whenever I first wore it, I didn't feel that comfortable just because it was a heightened level of formality. But once I started wearing it, I have to say I love my double-breasted suit. Well, I um, the only one time I found it uncomfortable and not in, in terms of socially out of context was when I wore a double-breasted pinstripe, a charcoal gray pinstripe in Singapore. And, uh, and, and if you know the dressing etiquette in Singapore, uh, having someone in a tie, let alone a jacket, is, uh, is a, a level of formality that is uh, fairly high in, in that social context. So when I was running around Singapore in a pinstripe double-breasted suit, yeah. uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a real standout. And, I, and that was the only time I ever felt uncomfortable socially out of context. But otherwise, I I, um, I have no qualms wearing a double-breasted suit in in work, um, and I guess I'm at a you know the level of my career whereby I can kind of dress the way it is because you know I'm I'm part of uh, the executive team in, in in the organization I work for, and uh, and I, I can wear it. Uh, I mean, I'm still conscious about it. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm careful how I wear it. So I, I typically would not wear it to a client, uh, you know, a client uh, engagement. I would typically wear uh, a, a single breast uh, to, 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 to client engagements uh, just for the, the over formality of things. But otherwise, in, in other, other contexts, I would wear it. It's not, a, not an issue for me. Yeah. And generally speaking, though, I mean, we've got a comment right here saying that uh, this particular gentleman doesn't see double breasts as any more or less formal. It's more a function of color and fabric. And, you know, technically, I think he's certainly correct. But generally, I mean, double-breasted mm. suits are, are, are perceived to be more formal, all things equal, than a, a single-breasted one. Well, no, I, I think that's the general perception. But, you know, I've seen people wear double-breasted and make it look very casual. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I think it's a function of how comfortable you feel in it. Um, and, and it shows. If you feel uncomfortable in something you're wearing, I've noticed this. Yeah. You fidget. Yeah, you you do. fidget yeah. by adjusting your collar. You fidget by adjusting your cuffs and things like that. You fidget. And, and if you don't uh, and you feel relaxed in it, it comes across uh, in a big way. I mean, I almost feel, I think, more comfortable in my double-breasted suit because you generally always leave it buttoned even whenever you're sitting. So there's less exactly. to fidget and, and mess with. I mean, it's normally just kind of always sitting perfectly. And, um, yeah. you know, there's a certain uh, just comfort in having the front panels kind of wrap you uh, that I think, you know, kind of just holds you in. And, um, you know, my, my piece that Joe Him or Johnny did for my tailor uh, is probably one of my most comfortable trousers or suits. And it has high-waisted trousers. I mean, properly cut loose trousers that I couldn't wear without braces. And um, that takes it to a whole nother level. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, and you you look great in uh, double breasted. I mean, I mean, just by your height and proportions, I think uh, I've seen you wear your double breasted suits before, and and proportionally, you get it right. I think for me, being five nine and being broader across the shoulder and chest, I've got to be very careful uh, in terms of proportions for a double breasted. I had some double breasted made previously before I started exploring with uh, Italian uh, and, and European tailors. I, I had some made uh, by by Asian tailors. And it never really suited me. Uh, and I think the reason for that was they were cutting it a little bit shorter uh, than the uh, the Italians and the uh, English were doing. In fact, if you look at my uh, Michael Brown, it, Michael Brown cuts it fairly long. Uh, and it gives me a completely different aesthetic. So I think that's a lot. That, that's the thing with a double breast. That that's, it, it's, the proportions in it is so much more critical. Yeah. And, and I think very skilled tailors can pull that off and it's 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 something that you really have to uh be careful about yeah well let's go to the third depiction so we're kind of again swinging back slightly less formal this looks to be a linen a, a beautiful kind of uh, oatmeal linen jacket um talk to me a little bit about this we'll go through some of your single breasted jackets uh, this one um is by again uh Gennaro paone uh, and this one here was uh um a linen for uh, from the Italian mill Cane, and uh, it was something that uh, I just fell in love with. I uh, I really like uh, beige and wheat uh, colors. Um, I have a, a predisposition for not having too much colors in my wardrobe. I tend to keep them fairly neutral. Um, a couple of pieces you saw there were were a bit out there because you know I was experimenting, but most of the time I tend to gravitate toward blue, grays, and browns and. And this one is one of my more comfortable jackets. You can see actually very clearly that uh, there's a lot of drape on this one. You can see it uh, just below the armhole. You can see the drape coming out. But then the waist suppression really helps with the chest and, and, and the skirt. And, uh, and, and the quarters really harmonizes the whole thing. Uh, the thing that is quite, um, uh, um, how should I say, uh, uh, interesting about this is that the fullness of the sleeve. You can actually see how full that sleeve is, uh, but yet, when you look at it straight on, it, it's fairly, it looks fairly narrow, but Gennaro actually cuts a very, very full sleeve, and I really like it. Yeah, and this would be, I guess, something a little bit more characteristic of the traditional kind of Neapolitan aesthetic. I mean, you can see that front uh, dart going all the way down through the pocket to the bottom, uh, soft shoulders. I mean, you can really see it just kind of falling off uh, kind of the shoulder line right there. Uh, and, um, you know, as you said, a little bit more drape kind of in, kind of around this area, you know, where the sleeve meets the shoulder. Yeah, and, and, and that's that's actually very old school Neapolitan. Um, and I think patch pockets too. Is, Those have pot, patch yes. pockets and a patch breast pocket. Yep, um, yep exactly. So it's very old school Neapolitan um, and, and it's it's cut in that old tradition. And, and I kind of let him have his way as well. I didn't, again, with this one, I, I gave very little instruction as to how he would cut it. And that's what I got. Yeah, great, great Actually, suit. Yeah, the, go my on. observation is the more, the more experience I get, the less I tell the tailor. Well, I think that's actually one of the wisdoms of a good uh, kind of client, um, you, know, you know, maker relationship is that, you know, if you're going to a truly talented bespoke tailor, you know, what you want is to really um, embrace their aesthetic and their artistry and their eye. And the more you try to override that, the more you really kind of sort, short circuit that kind of creative uh, relationship that you get whenever you go to a, to a truly master tailor, a master bespoke tailor. Now, if you're getting something made to measure, you know, maybe you're very specific and, uh, uh, about what it is you want, almost uh, prescriptive in a lot of ways. But I think whenever you go to a bespoke tailor, I mean, if you found the right guy, I mean, it should just flow and they should really be able to just kind of manifest something that you like without you having to really struggle with them uh, to produce that. You know, that, that's a really interesting observation. And one of the things I, uh, I realized as well, like in the tailoring, I, I found this to be quite important in how I lead my, uh, my teams at work as well. As I, I progress in my career, one thing I found is that I try to be less uh, prescriptive in how I want my team or individual team members to perform. And I allow and empower them to, uh, to find their own way. I continue to guide them just like I would my tailors, yeah. mm -hmm. but ultimately I, I empower them to, to get the outcome that we agree on. 
and uh, and it's the same thing. So in this case, it's 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 you know it's it's helped my career in in terms of how I work with my tailors. I also apply that to how I work with my team members, and it's come out to be quite uh, quite interesting. Yeah. So let's go to the fifth depiction. This is another uh, interesting jacket. Something in particular I want to talk about. Um, this looks like it might be from Gennaro also. Uh, no, this one is actually um, a, a, a Florentine cut. Um, I, it's a little bit difficult to see. Uh, it's slightly different. Uh, it's actually Florentine by uh, Kotaro, uh, Kotaro Miyahira, uh, and he is uh, he runs uh, Sartoria Kokos, and um, and he's is uh, is a great guy to work with. Uh, you know, very Japanese in aesthetic, but yet with an Italian flair. So uh, Kotaro is uh, uh, one of my favorite you know, tailors to work with. And he, he, this one here, it's a cashmere uh, uh, jacket, and, you know, he nailed it. It was It's one of my favorite winter jackets, odd jackets to wear. Yeah. Now talk to me a little bit about the lapel roll there, because I'm going to have Christian punch in in a bit, because I want you to speak about this on a lapel. Uh, but it looks like a three, I mean, is that just... I mean, it looks like it's it's rolling through. It looks like it w it's it looks like it's a three roll two, but the roll of the lapel actually goes through the second button also. Is that right? Am I seeing that right. correctly? Right, right, right. So, so one of the things with uh, uh, Kotaro's cut, unlike Liverano, is that Kotaro has a lower buttoning point, and his buttoning point is about an inch lower than uh, than a Liverano, for example, and and the more traditional uh, uh, Florentine cuts. But that that small difference creates uh, an elongated silhouette, at least in my eye, and uh, and and you can see the way that the uh, the roll flows in with the waist suppression. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm very careful about is that sometimes I don't like a lot of flare in in the skirt. Um, I I find that sometimes that that exaggerated flare uh, 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 distorts my proportion. Now that's just me. Uh, but in this case, he's nailed it because the, you can see how the lapel rolls, but yet the harmony of the lapel matches the harmony of the waist and down yeah. the, the skirt. Yeah. And uh, the other thing that blows me away with this one is the is the uh, pattern matching. His pattern match. He just nailed the pattern matching on this. Yeah, and you can really see it across the shoulder, uh, and even kind of into the lapel. But so speak to me also a little bit about the Florentine Florentine uh, lapel. So Florentine lapel. Um, I mean, it's a high gorge stance, right? High up on the shoulder. Um, yes. But what else? I mean... So, so the, 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 the aesthetic of a Florentine cut is um, three distinctive features. The first one is the, the level of the, the, the notch. You'll see that the notch is a lot higher than, than, uh, uh, than most other silhouettes. And it, it almost, um, the, the, the upper part of the collar almost flows naturally with the shoulder line. The second distinctive feature of the Florentine cut is the extended uh, shoulder line. So that's very, very common. You see that, that they extend so that So the shoulder is quite wide. I mean, it, it's actually <laughs> yes, cut correct. wider than your actual shoulders. Yeah. Yes, there's a shoulder extension to that. And what you then see is that the sleeve head helps uh, uh, balance that out. And then the final redeeming feature of, uh, of a Florentine cut uh, is that there is no front dot. So the, you yeah. can see how the patterns there are completely uh, 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 dis, uh, undistorted from that front dot that you would typically find with any other uh, 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 jacket. Uh, and, and that's one of the redeeming features. And, and many times, most of my Florentine cuts, I will make it as a pattern because that's the distinguishing feature you can see very yeah. clearly. And there's not even a side panel. I mean, so I mean, it's actually a lot of skill goes into shaping the jacket while not having that front dart that goes all the way down from the breast pocket uh, to the bottom of the jacket, like a Neapolitan or Southern Italian cut. Uh, but there's also mm -hmm. not a side panel, which you get in British suits. Am I correct? Correct. Correct. And, and where, where the real art is that is that the, there is a dart that goes on the side, but that dart is uh, it's slanted and it goes right up the back. And the other thing that, that you'll find with this is that a lot of the shape particularly in the Florentine cut, is achieved through uh, ironing. So there's a, a tremendous amount of ironing work that goes into this in order to get that shape. Yeah. And how is, I mean, talk to me a little bit about the longevity of the ironing because, I mean, again, so much of uh, the suit's shape is by virtue of the pressing 
And that can be done actually as the suit is being made before the panels are even sewn together. Uh, but it can also be done uh, at the end of the garment uh, after it's finished, shape is pressed into it. Uh, but uh, talk to me a little bit about the memory of the fabric and how that holds. And if, uh, you know, is that something you have to worry about kind of falling out of the garment or being dry cleaned out? Uh, or is that press, pressing uh, really permanent? Um, so I've been fortunate enough to have uh, several of my tailors train me in pressing. Um, so I press all my own jackets. Uh, and there is a particular art to it. Uh, but I've worked it out and uh, I do the pressing myself and, and it creates the, uh, it returns the 3D shape of the, of the jacket. Uh, but you're right, the, the first level of pressing is during the, uh, the shaping of the garment during the make. And that, that it happens a couple of times through the making. And then the final one is the final press that before they give it to you. And then after that, it's down to maintenance. Uh, and from the maintenance perspective, I, I press my own jackets. Yeah. So let's go to this uh, depiction number six. This, again, is a, a dramatic departure just in terms of the length of the lapel roll and the button stance. Uh, let's talk about this. It looks like it's uh, taken in front of the same hedge almost. Uh, you must have a, a doorman or a neighbor that uh, has been well trained at uh, photography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this one is a Liverano. Um, this actually is uh, uh, the first set of Liberanos that I had. So uh, when I when I commissioned my first set of Liberanos, I, I did uh, I did uh, 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 four four garments at once, uh, and I was fortunate enough to uh, at that stage it was the first time Liberano Antonio came to uh, Hong Kong, uh, and he was uh, brought up by Mark Cho and the Armory, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work with them uh, at that stage. I've known Antonio for a while. I was buying uh, ready to wear from uh, from him. Uh, I just couldn't didn't have the time to to invest in bespoke, but this was the first time I did it. And I was also fortunate enough that this this particular fabric is amazing. It's actually the lounge uh, uh, a tweet that uh, mm -hmm. that I think Nelly tweet that that's being remade at the moment by Alden. And uh, and and you can see how different this is from say the other jackets I have. Um, so the big distinguishing feature here is actually that roll to the quarter. Um, so the, the lapel roll and how it just gently sweeps out to give you that very um, uh, distinctive look in the, uh, uh, in the waist and, uh, and, and that, that quarter. And so it's slightly it's, concave, you know, it, the, the roll also. I mean, the lapel exactly. shape is slightly concave. Exactly. And I'm glad you, you, you saw that. And the other interesting feature here is that you'll notice that the, the, the height of the notch is a little bit lower than, uh, say, Kotaro's. So I would say that Kotaro's is a more modern uh, representation, and, uh, and, and a modern cut is that the notch is a lot higher. Uh, a more traditional, uh, older school notch is it's, it's somewhat lower. Um, and this is one of the things. And you can see from this that it, Liberano has a slightly distinct shoulder, and that shoulder is a little rounder. Uh, than say what you saw with uh, Kotaro uh, from that perspective. But again, you can see that the, uh, the pattern matching here is phenomenal. Uh, and with this one, I gave very little instructions to uh, Antonio. He, I, I just allowed him to do what he did. He chose that for this particular one, it was to be jetted pockets, no flaps. Um, and, and it gives it a very, very clean look. Yeah, now pull up uh, the seventh depiction because it looks honestly like the same fabric but a different colorway. Ah, so this is uh, this one is uh, another London Lounge tweed. Uh, again, y y it's uh, it's done in the same cut. Is this um, Liverano again, also? I, I mean, it looks. I mean, it's exactly it's the also, same. Yeah, this is also yeah. This is also Liverano, but you'll notice that in this one, the the roll is slightly different, and I think it's just the nature of the fabric. This one mm -hmm. is a uh, is again another tweed, but the, uh, the the thickness of this tweed is uh, is a, a a heavier tweed than the, the one you saw before. Yeah, and it's a beautiful caramel, and I can see you're wearing your, your quarantine mask. Is that is this a recent photograph? Uh, this was about maybe three weeks ago, okay. three, four weeks ago. Yeah, and, and talk to me about yeah. the trousers. I mean, because, uh, again, this is a beautiful kind of caramel, um, you know, jacket. I mean, a real soft kind of buttery brown, and it just looks beautifully with those, um, you know, khaki trousers. 
Yeah, so those trousers are from uh, Kotaro. Uh, so K Kotaro, in my opinion, probably makes uh, uh, my favorite trousers. Um, so it's not as narrow as the Neapolitans. It's a little bit fuller, but the way he cuts it uh, gives a lot of shape and uh, a lot of uh, a very nice uh, silhouette up the front. So, you know, this one here was a, a very simple outfit. I didn't want to track from the colors and mix too much colors together. I'm not particularly good at colors, so I, I tend to be a little bit boring when it comes to that. So when I have a loud piece like that, I keep all the other pieces uh, fairly neutral. Yeah. So, uh, so that combination worked out quite well. Yeah, that's great. So let, we're going to jump to the uh, depiction 10 now. I'm going to keep these kind of on odd jackets, and we seem to be on a little bit of a theme at the moment. Uh, this, again, exceptionally different than all the other pieces that we looked at. Um, so talk to us a little bit about that because it's got a strong kind of, um, you know, window pane uh, pattern to the fabric, which might make some of the elements of the cut difficult to see. Uh, but this is a very different jacket. This is, uh, this is where I decided to experiment a little bit. So this particular jacket is made by uh, 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 one of the more recent tailors I started working with, um, Satori Tofani. And... Um, uh, it's a father and son uh, operation. Uh, the, the son, uh, Aristide, is uh, very young. He is a very young man. I think he's maybe 22, 23. And his dad uh, is in his 50s. Both, uh, both, you know, very, very well-dressed individuals. And uh, this is a jacket that they made for me. And it's very Florentine, uh, sorry, Neapolitan in cut, but it has its different aesthetic. And you can see how rounded the shoulders are, how rounded the chest is by virtue of the way the, uh, the pattern is falling. And yeah. one thing they did here, which I thought was quite interesting, was that when they did the suppression on the front dot, they decided to remove the, 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 blue, uh, the blue panel altogether. And, mm -hmm. and that, that yeah. is quite distinctive. Yeah, because most, most Neapolitans would narrow it and just give you that slight hint of blue that would run down uh, uh, that, that dot into the pocket, but they decided to remove it. I didn't ask for it. They, that's how they did it. Um, it's fairly distinctive. Some people may not like it. Uh, I certainly, when I first saw it, I was a bit, you know, questionable. I was thinking, eh, is that is that right? But I've since grown to like it. Yeah, and beautiful pattern matching on those patch pockets. I mean, again, look at the beautiful symmetry. I mean, so much uh, of, uh, of the cutting on a jacket like this is matching the pattern. And here you can see the symmetry from the sleeves across the front panels, right? Again, is perfect. And then even lining up, I love that stripe, you know, right there, the, the bottom most, right, on this particular cut, you see uh, the sleeve, the patch pocket, the front panels, back across the patch pockets to the other sleeve. I mean, that's really quite remarkable. No, that, that, you, you got a good eye. And unfortunately, I didn't have a, a, a picture of this, but if you look at the collar, you will see that the blue, the blue panel, uh, the blue uh, uh, check, it's running right across the collar, and yeah. that actually curves. So the ironing work that goes into the collar, it, they've shaped the collar to make it to make that that straight line curve around the back of my my neck. Yeah. So we're gonna zoom in here a bit, so you can see kind of what Gary's talking about there. I mean, that's really exceptional. And I bet you a lot of that is by virtue of ironing, right? Is kind of ironing yeah, the shape ironing. into the cloth uh, before it's attached to the collar backing uh, because, you know, there's a, a tremendous amount of shape there that, of course, you wouldn't get with a, a window pane because it's a straight line. Yeah, exactly. And what, what it is is they're really shrinking the fabric. What they've done is they've shrunk the fabric to hold that shape. And uh, I was fortunate enough that uh, Davide, uh, who's the cutter of this, he actually showed me how to actually press back that shape into the collar. Um, and, and he does it in a, in a very particular way, and, and he yeah. was nice enough to show it to me. Well, that's a it's, good it's tip great. for anyone working with their bespoke tailor is to almost uh, demand uh, pressing classes at the, every delivery to say, okay, you've given me this beautiful jacket, now how do I deliver it? <laughs> or how do I press it? With, with this particular jacket and uh, the particular cut that I uh, arrived with, Tofani, is that uh, we did two things. The, the first thing I did was I... I I purposely chose a lower notch, so you'll see that this notch is fairly low. It's again in the tradition of old style Neapolitan. And uh, the other thing was the shoulder. So in this particular case, uh, they actually have a little bit of padding in the shoulder. 
uh, and and it gives it a round uh, look to it uh, that is a little bit more distinct. Yeah, and then uh, talk a little bit also about the uh, the notch, right? Positioning. I mean, it's a very low gorge, um, and again, very different. And I mean, it's a it's a three roll two, uh, but the lapel, again, with the button uh, positioning, is quite quite short um, compared to all yeah. your other jackets I've seen. So one of the interesting things is that uh, I, I found that tailors, um, you know, by virtue of themselves, um, cut a particular way because if the tailor is similar height to you, they know how to cut for you because they're cutting for themselves. So in this case, Davide and I are fairly the same height. So, uh, so the way he's done it from a proportion perspective is very similar to what he cuts for himself and, and he nailed it. I, I, I think it's very distinctive. It's set from the all the jackets that I have, but it, it, it gives me a, 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 a nicer proportion, I think, because by virtue of shortening the, the distance between uh, the, the buttoning point with the notch and with the collar, he's somewhat elongated my torso. And I think that's really neat. Yeah, it's a, definitely a, a certain kind of aesthetic effect there. So let's see, I'm just jumping up, see. Okay, so let's go to 13, uh, which is the last of our odd jackets. Well, no, not quite, but uh, second to last uh, odd jacket. Um, you know, Christian, try to punch in a little bit. So uh, this, talk to us about this. Another beautiful odd jacket. Again, just a beautiful, uh, just color matching uh, with, you know, the blue navy trousers kind of bringing out the navy and that stripe while still offering a little bit of a contrasting kind of rust uh, a primary color to that jacket. And this, again, must be in the height of a Hong Kong summer because, you know, you're definitely rocking some chest there. <laughs> this was actually in uh, Bangkok. Um, so I, I, I was doing a lot of, uh, I, I did, a, you know, in, in 2019, I did a lot of work in uh, Bangkok. I was spending a lot of time in Bangkok. And I was fortunate enough to uh, to hang out with uh, the guys at uh, Decorum, uh, who are great dear friends of mine, and as well as uh, another gentleman there, uh, Charles Yap, who's uh, a, a very close friend. And and this jacket um, uh, is mystery bespoke tailor. Uh, you'll see that the collar and, and the lapel itself has a bit of belly, um, and which is which is again different from the others that you've seen. Uh, the Tofani lapel is a lot straight uh, 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 straighter. This one has a belly to it. Uh, this one here, the fabric is actually uh, uh, the bamboo from uh, Huddersfield Fine Worsted. Uh, it's something that Jeff uh, and I kind of picked, Jeff Wheeler and I picked out together, and uh, it, it turned out really well. Does it have uh, any silk in it? It looks like a blend. Did you say bamboo? Uh, no, it's bamboo. Uh, it's basically bamboo fabric uh, fibers. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and interesting enough, you see that the shoulder line for, uh, uh, for this particular cut is it's far more uh, 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 acute. Um, so it, it, it showcases the, my shoulder a little bit more. The, the interesting thing enough about this is that there's no padding in that. That's completely natural shoulder line. Uh, really? there's, there's zero there's it's a clean zero shoulder. padding in it. It's completely clean shoulder. And it's clean uh, at the, again, at the I, sleeve I, head too, uh, at the shoulder. That's yeah. very clean. Doesn't have any of the um, my, ruffling. Yes, my, my that was a specific specific request. So uh, I I basically told uh, Mr. Bespoke Taylor there is there should be no ruffling on my shoulders, and uh, they nailed it. This was uh, this is a this is a really nice jacket. Yeah, that is beautiful. So let's go to seventeen and eighteen next. Um, a lot of great stuff to talk through. So this is uh, I'm actually enjoying this more than I uh, suspected. Uh, it's fun. So uh, well, not that I wasn't thinking I would ex uh, enjoy it, but it's fun. I mean, this is I mean what's so great with someone like you that has again such a broad range of of uh, tailors and uh, uh, different garments is kind of just talking through all these different elements because you know this is what makes uh, dressing and clothing fun is to kind of see all the different possibilities out there, not just in fabrics, but if in cuts, and then even, you know, even, you know, more specifically to the way that the lapels are cut and the notches and the, uh, you know, the pockets and all this. So um, this, is, this is a lot of fun. So let's look at this one right here. So this is, uh, yeah, number 17, another odd jacket. Seems like, I mean, do you dress in odd jackets more than you do full suits, or is that just kind of how the, um, the, uh, the 
uh, pitcher's game. And actually, Hugo Giacome just joined uh, the live stream, so he says hello. Uh, Hugo and I are speaking tomorrow, and I think based off how much fun this is, I'm going to see if Hugo can pull together some pitchers also, because um, you know, I'd love to hear him talk through some of his garments the same way that you're talking through yours right now. So Hugo's on the channel. Everyone say hello to Hugo. Um, to, uh, Satorial, um, Satorial Talks, and of course, the Parisian gentleman. Um, Bonjour, uh, Hugo. Um, hope you and Sonia are well. Uh, and thank you for joining us. So this jacket, uh, I mean, another odd jacket. I mean, are you wearing mostly odd jackets? I mean, is that just kind of... Uh, I kind of, I kind of wear odd jackets when uh, I feel, I, I feel I want to be a little bit more casual or, or dandyish, so to speak. Because one of the things is when this one in particular was, uh, I was doing an event with uh, 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 the team at Decorum. Uh, we were having a, 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 a book event uh, in Bangkok, and sometimes when you do these kind of things, you are expected to dress a little bit uh, different. So. Um, Instead of rocking up in a suit uh, and, and, and fairly being fairly conservative, I thought I'd try something different. Uh, and in this case, I thought I'll, I'll just play monochromatic, uh, a monochromatic theme and, and just go all blue as far as I could go. And as a result, this was what it was. Again, this jacket here is a Mystery Bespoke Taylor. Uh, the fabric in this is particularly uh, interesting. It's actually Sunbeam from uh, Harrison's. Unfortunately, they discontinued this. But uh, it's probably one of the most uh, luxurious uh, hop sack uh, style uh, fabric uh, that was ever made. I, 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 I've got you know, two different uh, styles of cl uh, cloth from this line, and it turned out really well. Uh, in, this, in this particular cut, um, it, it was one of my very first commissions from Mr. Bespoke Taylor. I was a little bit concerned because I got this only as two meters. And one of the rule of thumb is that if you are going to make a, a patent jacket, you want to give your tailor a little bit more cloth, uh, uh, typically about two and a half meters for this. So I was a little bit concerned, to, and that helps with the patent matching. Uh, and I was a little bit concerned that I didn't give him enough, but you know they, they worked it through and, 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 and they, uh, uh, they got a great result. In this case, uh, the trouser is a little bit narrow. It's by Tofani. Uh, and I thought, you know, I'll pair it up and go a bit uh, spread the tour and wear the the the, uh, the the tie a little long and and have the back blade a little bit longer. Um, and but you know, I I kind of think it works out quite well. It's not to everyone's style. And the other thing too, it's a blue navy blue trouser can be quite difficult to wear. Um, but you know, I kind of played with this and I kind of think it's okay. But you know, it it might not be for everyone. Yeah. All right, let's hit 18, and this is our last kind of odd jacket. We'll go through some of the suits. Uh, this is a beautiful tweed piece. Um, you know, again, I don't know. It's got a ticket pocket, which I haven't seen on many of your pieces, uh, which is a beautiful addition for a tweed jacket, I feel. Otherwise, I'm not a big fan of ticket pockets. Um, but um, talk to us about this. I mean, this is just kind of a classic tweed. looks like you've got a pair of gray flannel trousers with that and a light blue shirt. Uh, and then, you know, really getting advanced there with the, uh, you know, the tie kind of, again, pulling out the color uh, in that uh, overpaint or overcheck. Yeah, so the, let's start with the fabric. This, this fabric is, uh, I would like to think, fairly unique. Uh, it was actually a prototype from uh, the London Lounge. So as, uh, for those of you who know, uh, the London Lounge Cloth Club, uh, um, run by Michael Alden is, uh, is a very uh, interesting community whereby, you know, Michael and, 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 and the London Lounge team are constantly looking to replicate or, or uh, create traditional fabrics from, from, you know, way back. And this one here was a, a subscription that never got ahead. And I was fortunate enough to get, uh, a, you know, a length of, uh, uh, of the fabric for, uh, from, from the prototyping phase. Uh, this particular jacket is made by uh, Steed, uh, by Edwin and uh, Matthew, and uh, it it's a very English cut. So it's uh, you know uh, Edwin and uh, is, is uh, an ex Anderson Shepherd cutter, and you can see the distinctive nature of Anderson Shepherd here, particularly the fullness in the chest, uh, as well as the softness of the uh, the shoulder. Um, there is a there's literally no 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 uh, padding on that shoulder. And the interesting thing with uh, this particular cut is that um, the waist suppression, it's very English. 
you can see the skirt coming out and the uh, the squareness but more uh, um, angular shape of the quarters which is quite distinct from say the uh, uh, the Neapolitans and the Florentines so you can see that at the buttoning but buttoning point it acutely cuts out and it mm -hmm. cuts off fairly straight right until the end and then there's a small curve to it um, so yeah so I, I, I find the uh, the uh, steep cut to be you know very 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 uh, comfortable but the silhouette is quite formal uh, and that waist suppression uh, for me that 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 waist suppression is uh, is the the real distinction in the cut and you can see how from the chest into the waist and then back into the skirt it it's fairly narrow and it's fairly straight yeah it's a beautiful jacket I mean uh, I love the balance I mean it's a perfectly balanced very clean cut uh, and very I guess quintessentially British um, and it works perfectly with that tweet. I really like that. Uh, and again, showing quite a bit of, of sleeve there. Is that, is that kind of, I mean, how does your preference fall in terms of, of uh, just how much cuff you're showing? Ah, so sometimes people, people joke about my, my um, I get a lot of comments on my Instagram that constantly there's a bit of sleeve. Uh, unfortunately, what, I, what happens with my shirts is that I, I've cut my, my right or left sleeve depending to the size of my the cuff to the size of my uh, my watch and sometimes I wear the watch sometimes I don't wear the watch and sometimes at the end of the day you know when you when you wear your garment um, things move around and stuff like that yeah. so I don't really pay too much attention to that for me that's uh, you know aesthetically it's pleasing but you know ultimately it's my uh, you know I, I kind of don't care <laughs> yeah no there you go that's a perfectly uh, acceptable <laughs> answer I mean everything else everything about it's perfect not everything else everything is we're gonna just jump back if you if you're still okay on time I'm keeping you up all night let me know if you need to jump off but let's jump to some of your suitings let's go to uh, depiction number six now um, which uh, you have to remind me if we hit this already I'm starting to forget but um, yeah, this yeah, is a beautiful yeah, we, hit we hit this one okay so let's jump to number nine then which looks like it's a suit, but it might be an odd trouser or an odd jacket. I'm having a little bit of trouble seeing just in the photograph that I have printed. Uh, so this one right here, let's talk about that. That looks like a suit. Yeah. That that's a suit. So that's a. Uh, so being in Asia, and being in a, a tropical climate, uh, one of my go-to fabrics is uh, hop sacks, and the hop sack that I particularly like the most is actually the uh, fresco from uh, Huddersfield Fine Worcester. Uh, the mini fresco, and um, I think this is a, a a very interesting jacket. It was one of my very first uh, jackets that I made, and and it's uh, it remains a classic. Um, I, I I made this in a three piece, uh, and I had some interesting conversations with uh, various members on on style form because I made a three piece uh, suit from fresco, and there was some discussion on whether uh, uh, it's really appropriate. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. To make a three piece, but I kind of said, well, I, I don't, I don't kind of subscribe to that kind of formality because, firstly, I was kind of ignorant to it, but secondly, in Asia, if I wanted to make a, uh, you know, a basically a four season suit, uh, that would be the way to do it. Uh, the interesting thing with fresco, if uh, for those of you who are into it, if you go for the heavier fresco, it can be a little bit rough. Uh, particularly if you don't line the trouser, it can be quite rough, particularly around your thigh, and it could be scratchy. Um, and one of the ways to get around that is to get your tailor to li line your trouser up to your knee. And that actually helps to remove, obviously, the, uh, uh, the scratchiness. But again, in discussion with various other tailors and, uh, and, and cloth merchants, over time, you just get used to it. Yeah. Um, so I have trousers that I haven't lined, uh, but you know, I I, I don't I kind of don't feel it anymore. So you just yeah. get used to it. <clears throat> yeah, the Eric Jensen piece that I'm wearing today is a very heavyweight fresco. I mean, I think it's a 12 or 13 ounce, uh, and it's an yeah. absolutely beautiful bulletproof piece. And I can feel what you're saying with the trousers. Uh, but you know, in some ways, I actually enjoy kind of feeling the body and the structure of the fabric. So uh, it's not uh, distracting or uncomfortable for me in any way. You're right, and I, I got this particular uh, suit because uh, it was my travel, one of my default travel suits. Because when you travel, um, and and you know, there's a couple of things I've learned from you as well around travel, and that is to always keep a pair of uh, shoelaces in my yeah. travel bag. Yeah, that's right. You never know when it's snapped. 
And I, I, it's happened to me, and, and uh, I've, I've taken your advice on that. But the second thing in terms of travel is that you don't want to be constantly uh, pressing suits, you know, sometimes in the, in the situation whereby, uh, you know, you might be in a hotel and for whatever reason. You never you know, know what you, type of you iron you have. To, yeah, you don't have the right iron or you don't have the right thing. Something like this, you just hang it on to, uh, you hang it on the in, the in the in the shower, steam it up and off you go. Yeah, it's perfect. And I mean, do you wear a lot of uh, loafers with your suits or are you primarily a lace-up guy? I'm a lace-up guy. Um, however, however, more recently, uh, I've started doing uh, side gussets, uh, primarily because uh, when I go to, uh, what I find is when you go to the izakayas and some of the restaurants, you have to take off your shoes. And uh, I found it that it was rather annoying to be, you know, oh, yeah. taking off shoes and, and, and taking, going through the laces and everything. And and, and most often you go to a izakaya for dinner, sake is flowing, and by the end of the night, you have to then tie your shoelace again. It, it, it becomes a little bit uh, annoying. So uh, my last two or three commissions in, 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 in shoes have been loafers and side gussets. In fact, uh, Nicholas just is making me a, a side gusset at the moment. And uh, it, it's primarily for that, for that, for that use. Uh, so I do have a few loafers, but I'm more of a lace-up guy. Yeah. Guy. I'm wearing my black uh, pigskin Baron Dorides right now, which I enjoy a great loafer. I mean, especially just for the ease of putting them on, they're comfortable. And then the side gussets, uh, like a lazy man, I mean, gosh, talk about some exceptional shoes for travel because, uh, I mean, they just, as your foot swells, the entire shoe kind of swells with you. Uh, and it's easy mm -hmm. to take on and off to go through security. Uh, and I think that uh, a good uh, kind of lazy man is one of my favorite shoes uh, to travel with, or suede, uh, just because suede, uh, is so durable, you really don't have to worry about scuffing or scratching suede. Um, so real quick on this jacket, I mean, again, I see that that front dart cut, is it cut all the way through the pocket or in what I, I'm seeing, the patch pocket right there? And then it's got a very high uh, kind of a gorge placement there. I mean, almost all the way on top of the shoulders uh, with a pretty nicely balanced lapel. I mean, it's not wide, it's not, you know, it's not narrow. I mean, it's, you know, kind of right in the middle ground there. Looks like it's just slightly right at the halfway point. Maybe slightly half. Yeah, I mean, past. I, I get a lot of questions on Instagram. Uh, people asking me, you know, what is the uh, the width of my lapels? And and most of the time, I don't actually sp spend a lot of attention on it. I mean, I let the the tailor naturally do it. Now, I have a bit of a broad chest, um, and and because of that, I can I tend to go for a wider lapel. But in this case, it, it's 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 aesthetically pleasing because it, the proportions are correct. So one of the things that I always, you know, when people direct mail me and ask me about these kind of measurements and proportions, it's, uh, you know, it, it's very difficult for me to say, you know, it's, it's four, four centimeters there and, and, and things like that. And, and, you know, another question I always get is, you know, how, how, how thick are the cuffs on my, uh, on my trouser? And it, it really depends on your proportions. Yeah. So that's one of the big fallacies in, uh, in Bespoke is that just because it works on me, it doesn't mean it will work on you. Because for a range of factors, um, um, and, 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 and that's part of uh, the scope, you should really allow the tailor to create something for you rather than micromanage them and go there with specific proportions that you're trying to replicate. Yeah. And, and I can tell you, one of the interesting things is the more you try to micromanage your tailor, the, the, the more difficult it is for them to be working with you. Yeah, uh, and because you you cease to become a, a good customer, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but you know, depends on just how you like to work with your tailor. From from my perspective, I allow them to do do their thing. But in this case, this is a this is one of my favorite go to suits. This is one of the suits that I wear for travel. If I'm seeing clients, I don't want to think about it. I can match this very quickly with either a pattern or white shirt. Uh, I tend to just keep it simple. When I'm uh, doing business, I, I kind of don't want to stand out. I want to keep things simple. And this is one of my go-to outfits for, uh, for, for suiting. Yeah, I love a beautiful kind of monochromatic gray. I mean, it's my favorite of, of kind of all the palettes. And a great here with kind of a, a black, uh, you know, London dot tie. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful suit. So let's go next to, um, let's see, let's hit uh, depiction number 11 next. This is a brown, another suit, beautiful kind of yellow tie. Uh, pull that up real quick. That's it. There we go. So, um, beautiful trousers. 
And again, totally different lapel shape uh, than uh, what we just saw. I mean, much wider uh, lapel with a longer collar. So um, let's pull this up on the half screen and, or on the full screen and uh, have you talk uh, to us about this, Gary. So this um, uh, is a Neapolitan style uh, suit, uh, but it's made by a Japanese uh, craftsman. So this is a Japanese interpretation of a Neapolitan uh, suit. Uh, the fabric here is Holland and Sherry Crispair. Uh, and I have a very interesting story with this, uh, this particular tailor. Uh, and he's requested, and in this case, the, 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 he remains a mystery because he requested that I don't reveal who he is because uh, he's trying to keep his, uh, his workflow and his, uh, his, 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 uh, uh, you know, his ability to cons uh, uh, pay attention to each garment he makes. Uh, so he's actually not looking to expand his production. So he's he's always asked me to just you know keep 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 him uh, anonymous. But he's Japanese. Uh, he trained at Panico, and uh, one of the things that he did, which was quite memorable uh, in terms of the experience, was uh, I kind of asked him to if he would make me a suit, and uh, he actually responded to me by saying, uh, "I'll think about it." <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it was Very a really Japanese. interesting thing. And, uh, very Japanese, and then what he did was he disappeared for about 30 minutes or so, and uh, I was hanging out with some other people, and then he came back and he said, I want to make you a very peculiar suit. I want to make, uh, he actually suggested initially a khaki colored suit from the uh, Crispair book, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not a big fan of green, so I kind of said, why did you pick that? He says, well, I disappeared for 30 minutes, firstly to, uh, to speak to somebody else, but then I went through your Instagram, and I noticed that you didn't have a khaki suit, and I want to make you a khaki suit. And I said, I'm, I'm not a big fan of khaki, particularly in a suit, and I don't think I could pull that off. So we then negotiated. So this is the first time I had to negotiate with a uh, tailor, <laughs> tailor on what he was going to make for me. And uh, we landed on brown. And, uh, and, and, and this one is a very full cut. Uh, the trouser in particular is very, very full. But it, it works. I mean, he's nailed it. It's it's one of I kind of it took me two and a half years to get this suit. Um, we went through a couple of uh, iterations of it, uh, and primarily because I didn't get a chance to go back to Tokyo as as frequently as I wanted. But uh, but ultimately he he nailed it and he did a great job. Yeah, and are you? I mean, are most of your jackets a three roll twos? They're all three roll two. Yeah, and what talk to me a little bit about that? Like you know your opinion on a three roll two versus just a proper two button. What I really like about the three row two, you'll see it in this in this particular picture, is that 3D element where just at the buttoning point, there's a, a, a curvature to it. And I really like the aesthetic of that curvature. I think a garment is actually three dimensional. It's it's mm -hmm. not flat, it's you know, it's 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 alive, so to speak. And and a lot of creases and, and the way the garment moves is by nature of the garment. So uh, the, the three row two for me ultimately showcases that. And one and, of the things I'm very careful about is, is pressing that three roll two back into into shape. Yeah. Now, I mean, so I mean, but there's a lot of ways to create the lapel roll. I mean, most traditionally, just through the pad stitching is kind of how you would put yes. that memory into the garment. Uh, I mean, why not just request from the tailor to just you know really create fullness to the roll versus putting a buttonhole there? Because with the buttonhole, it's the structure of that button hole that is actually kind of adding the fullness to that roll. So, talk to me about that. I don't know. I mean, aesthetically, I just kind of like the three roll too. I mean, um, I, I, I find it to be aesthetically pleasing. Uh, I don't have anything against a two button. I mean, Steve and English tend to make two buttons, and, and, and Steve makes all of mine two buttons. So I, I do have two button suits uh, and jackets. Uh, but I kind of never really questioned that, and, and I just found it, and, and I don't think too much about it. I just I just allow the tailor to do what they do. And the Neapolitan styling is literally always three row two, so I allow them to do it. I, yeah. I, I, like I said, I don't micro-fish my tailors. Well, I mean, um, you know, Prince of Wales on, you know, Duke of Kent, I mean, a lot of, I mean, they say a lot of ways that the three row two is very aristocratic um, because most, mm -hmm. of, at least the British ar aristocracy, you know, they're either wearing a double-breasted or a three row two. So it's kind of an interesting distinction. I've always, I've always found the, uh, the, third buttonhole kind of superfluous and so 
like if you're rolling it to two, in my opinion, I've always just taken a proper two button uh, suit. So it's just interesting to kind of talk about some of these uh, nuances uh, here because um, that's what's fun. So let's hit the next depiction, number 12. I think that this is one of our, our last ones. Um, so this is not a suit, but it's, it's formal. Uh, and again, a beautiful kind of gray odd jacket with, it looks like, are those black or a dark gray pair of trousers? So the, those are dark gray uh, fresco trousers from Paone, uh, Gennaro Paone. So pa G Gennaro makes a very, very full trouser. It doesn't look like it there, but certainly it's not the, uh, the typical Neapolitan narrow trouser look that you would typically find in the modern uh, incarnations of uh, Neapolitan trousers. Uh, this one's a, uh, a lot fuller. The jacket uh, from this is actually from uh, another Japanese maker, but from Milan. So this is a uh, Yuki Inoue. And uh, in this particular one here, uh, what caught me with uh, Yuki's cut is actually the shape of his lapel. So if you go to Yuki's uh, uh, website or, or uh, Instagram, you'll notice that his lapels are quite distinctive. And that distinction actually is a particular defunct house from Milan. Now, I may get the history wrong because I'm taking the story from him, but this is a, a particular uh, uh, a tailor, uh, Satora Colombo, which no longer exists. But the way they, they cut that particular lapel is distinctive. And you don't find that in Milanese tailoring, which tends to be a little bit sharper and, and more angular. But the way Yuki makes it is that there's a, a roundness to his lapel, and it really showcases it if you look at his... Uh, uh, in particular, his single button, uh, sorry, his single uh, breasted peak lapels. You'll see that he's got a lot of belly to it, uh, and and there's a, a very distinct lapel style. And I kind of like that because I could have gone for a more traditional Milanese cut, but a traditional Milanese cut is very formal, very English to, to some extent. And I was looking for something a little bit different, and, and his cut uh, really works out. Uh, the challenge I had with this particular jacket, though, and this is something that Hugo and I spent quite a bit of time talking about, is fluctuation in weight. So because we had tend to have to wait a while to get the, the garment anywhere between 6 to maybe 12, 18, 24 months, I've waited that long before, your weight tends to fluctuate. And uh, in, unfortunately or fortunately, this particular jacket uh, was through a, a period where my weight was fluctuating uh, dramatically. And as a result of it, uh, my chest uh, actually changed quite a little bit. And, uh, and, and interestingly enough, uh, you know, there, there's, there's quite an interesting amount of drape in this particular jacket that you wouldn't see in other uh, of Yuki's creations. But that was because I was going through a bit of weight change. And uh, yeah. as a result, that's what I got. And it's an unusual collar, too. I mean, the, the collar itself is quite large. I mean, I guess in some ways you could say it balances the lapels, uh, but it's a, you know, that the entire kind of aesthetic of the lapels kind of rolling up around the collar is very full here. Correct. And, and interesting enough, he's uh, one of the Italian tailors that actually, or, you know, he, he, he does a fish mouth lapel. So you can see that it's not as uh, 90 degree as, as most uh, Italian yeah. tailors would cut it. It's actually very French in that way. Yeah, well, very uh, comes to Luca uh, as because they, I mean, they of course are, are very well known for their fish mouth lapel. Yes, exactly. Mm. Beautiful jacket. And again, I love that uh, just that color palette. Anyone that watches this channel knows I'm a big fan of gray. So let's just hit uh, 16 real quick. This is just a flattering picture of Gary. So um, do that full screen if you can. Uh, let's see. Pulling that up. So uh, real quick while we're waiting for Christian to pull 16, um, what's your opinion on cuffs versus uh, no cuffs? Uh, do you kind of go back and forth on that, or are you pretty consistent in terms of kind of what you think? In terms of uh, shirt cuff, right? No, 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 uh, just the trouser cuffs. Oh, trouser cuff. Uh, I, I tend to favor trouser cuff. Um, I went through a stage where I didn't have cuffs, but for some reason I kind of like the aesthetic of cuffs now, so all my trousers are cuffs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of go back and forth. Most of the stuff I'm having made these days is all cuffed, but then I've got a few pairs of trousers that are uncuffed that I just love that elongated silhouette, uh, especially with a slightly kind of narrower cut in the leg itself. Uh, it can really be quite, quite slick, in my opinion. Well, 
in in your case, I think you look great in a uncuffed uh, trouser because you are taller, and and you're also quite slim. So because of that silhouette, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I've known you for a while, and you've always been able to maintain your shape. So uh, that's really good. But but. Your aesthetic works really well that way, and I, I think you you actually pull off the the uncuffed look uh, very well, uh, and 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 I think also your style is very English, uh, very aristocratic, uh, very uh, noble, and I think uh, sometimes the uh, uncuffed look uh, is a lot cleaner when it comes to that respect. Yeah, definitely is a very clean look. So do we have 16 ready? Let's just throw that up there. This is a good picture of Gary with uh, someone in the background of a mirror. Um, but uh, I guess in front of some shoes, this is another jacket I think we may have seen already, actually. Yep, this is uh, yeah. the one from the event you were at in Singapore. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, just a, kind of a beautiful, that actually may have been at the same event because it looks like it's actually the same exact outfit. But um, yeah, you know, another it's photograph of the same piece, but it just, again, shows kind of how balanced it is, and it's really beautiful. Yeah. So are you still there? Yeah, I am. Yeah. yeah. No, but uh, like I said, I mean, this is just a different angle. You can see how how high the armhole is. Yeah. Uh, the pattern met from a different uh, different uh, angle, uh, and you can really see the three dimensional nature of the, the the jacket because, as you can see, this particular one, you can see that the button point for mystery bespoke tail is a little higher. Yeah, it uh, is. And that, for that sure. particular aesthetic is, is quite interesting. You can really see it there. Yeah. What, any opinions on pocket flaps and flap pockets, uh, ticket pockets, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the jetted pockets? Uh, what are your, where are you on that, just in terms of your general uh, thoughts? Well, um, it depends on the casualness of the, um, um, the garment uh, and also the fabric. So um, I had a very interesting exchange with uh, Topani the other day. They were making me a very loud jacket. And uh, I kind of suggested that because the patterns were so loud, I wanted a jetted, jetted pocket. And we had a we had an interesting WhatsApp disagreement uh, around it. And uh, they they finally convinced me that I shouldn't go for a jetted pocket. I should go for a, a patch pocket. But generally, what I find is that the more casual the fabric, the uh, the more uh, you could go down the uh, the, the uh, uh, patch pocket look. Uh, the more solid or the more formal the, uh, the, the the garment, you could go without the or you could go with a jet pocket. But to be honest, I kind of don't spend that much time thinking about those things. I just go with the flow. I, sometimes I, I sometimes I, I just you know I leave it to the tailor. You know, I just say to them, you do as you wish. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Gary, hey, thank you so much. Anything else? I mean, you'd like to add, or um, I mean, I could keep you up all night. Um, you know, we could start talking about how to select a tailor next and be here well into the morning. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I want to be I want to be conscious of the fact that it's quite late. It's pushing 4 a.m. for you. Um, so I, I don't want to keep you up any later than I have already. No, that's cool. That's fine. I'm, I'm going for a run at about seven. So uh, it's no big deal. Uh, <laughs> well, but... <laughs> I don't wake you up. So, Take a uh, cold shower. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, exactly. But no, I. I I have nothing more to add. I don't know if you've got any questions from your viewers that you want to cover off on. But uh, well, they're you know, asking what shoes you're wearing right now. But it's 4 a.m. You might not be wearing shoes. <laughs> I just... uh, I'm, I'm... <laughs> yeah, no, I'm. Uh, I'm Dude, whatever I'm you do, don't any... stand up. I don't want to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that 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 uh, the new Zoom trick. Everyone's yeah, that's from right. home and doing. Basically, you throw on something, but you're really in shorts or something. <laughs> yeah. Right, well, thank you so much. You know, stay safe, stay healthy. Of course, anyone that's interested in Gary's book, Master Shoemakers, you know, we've got this here available uh, on HangarProject.com. Ships the same day or next day, depending on what time you place your order. Beautiful kind of coffee table piece. Uh, anyone that uh, is into shoes, I mean, this is a beautiful piece. Uh, and I have to say, Gary really did an exceptional job with the photography. I mean, this is a book full of eye candy. Uh, and where possible, uh, Gary actually got uh, pretty full access to a lot of these makers' archives of samples. So you're actually able to see a lot of their kind of archival sample pieces, which can give you a really good historical perspective of some of these house styles and some of the older, uh, slightly uh, more kind of vintage-oriented shoes. I mean, I guess proper vintage for some of these, especially like some of the Cleverleys that we know are very old. Um, so great book. 
couldn't recommend that anymore. And uh, hey, Gary, uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you for joining us, and uh, you know, hopefully, you get uh, one or two hours of shut eye before your 7 a.m. jog. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for having me on. Yeah, Gary. Hey, thank you so much. And one of the things I'll ask you to do is, well, maybe if you send us a list of some of the links to some of these suit makers, it might be interesting for the people that watch this video afterwards or that watch this one to be able to go back and go check out some of these makers because, um, you know, it's kind of always fun to kind of, you know, see who these people are, where they are, and I guess more importantly, uh, what their trunk show schedules are to the extent, uh, you know, that they travel. For sure. I'll do that for you. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Gary. Good night. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you to everyone that's watching. Uh, I appreciate all of you for tuning in, for sharing a little bit of your day with us. I'm Kirby Allison, and I love to help the well-dressed acquire and care for their wardrobes. Thanks for joining me.